Welcome, part two of my Aging Gracefully. Discussion, your health. Our health is our wealth. I think as baby boomers, we really realize this. And yes, we get it. You exercise, you eat right, we got it. And we got that covered, so to speak, right? But also, I do want to make a disclaimer. Remember, we're all uniquely and have different genetics. You need to seek out a healthcare professional. And to me, someone that's attuned not only to traditional medicine, but also to other medicines and ways of doing things the same way they did back in the 19, early 1900s. And you kind of refer to these people as naturopaths. But again, totally your choice. It's your body. But you really need to have guidance from a professional. As far as what I personal, personally do and my journey to good health, I never really thought about it that much. I think just naturally, I tended to gravitate towards eating healthy because I was a baby boomer. You see, in my generation, my mother, it was easy. She would get food and groceries, and not from a grocery store, from, but from a local farmer. And my aunt, they even lived in a farm in Montana. When we would go and visit, they'd go out to the, the chicken uh, area and get fresh eggs and then go and, and get some raw milk from the cow. That's just the way life was. Now, this was back in the 19, late 40s, 1950s. Then we started to see a kind of a, a change in more of a mass uh, of marketing. This is where the big grocery stores started, started being developed because of our generation. Remember, the baby boomer generation put a massive pressure on the world for everything from food, from cars, from products, from health care, everything because of our numbers. Even my class, my whole uh, class from elementary school all the way through college, it was always the, my generation where we put pressure on the colleges, on the classroom, on the sizes. They were always over full. They sometimes had to have two classes. But that's changing because slowly we're dying out. <laughs> and the pressure on the world, on all these things, the pressure is not going to be there. And it's not there. And you're seeing these big, huge companies mass producing food, they themselves are having problems, even staying in business because the demand is just not there. But I digress. But we, were, we, we evolved into this mass production because of our pressure on the food supply. And that caused those companies to make things for profit. And you really can't blame them. They're just companies mass producing food, coming up with new ideas like potato chips and all this kind of stuff for profit. That's what companies do. But we're now learning and the pendulum is kind of shifting back. We're learning, uh oh, perhaps that's causing obesity and all these diseases with diabetes and all these things. Diabetes wasn't, I didn't even know what the word was back in the early sixties. The same with Alzheimer's. I didn't even hear that word until the 1980s. So you have to understand we're shifting back to my grandma's way of doing things again. Buying local. You grow, grow vegetables. You grow tomatoes. Like in my little community, I live in a condominium and I'm, I'm a widow. It's just myself. I can't go to my local farmer. Now, they'll have farmer's market during the weekends where I can go and purchase fruit and vegetables. But there is a health food store that actually is taking a lot of families, such as me, one person, combining me with another family, maybe of five people. And in bulk, we place orders to the local farmer who delivers it to my health food store. And then they alert me. I stop by and pick up my locally grown products. 
But still, I do go to grocery stores because it's just easier. And I do even have groceries delivered to me because it's just easier. But when I'm in the grocery store, I never go up and down the middle aisles. It's always on the periphery. I'm always going to the produce. I love avocados. I love vegetables. And that's just what I buy. Other than your paper towels and those basic needs. But that's basically what I do. And number two, listen to your own body as far as your hunger. When we're younger, we're in this program, you have breakfast, you have a snack in between, you have lunch and another snack or whatever. That probably works well when you're younger, but I find that I'm never hungry in the morning. I mean, when I first retired, yes, I was having my oatmeal with my blueberries and, and um, you know, some seeds and chia seeds or whatever to be healthy. But I really wasn't hungry. So I decided to listen to myself. And right now I seem to be in a pattern where I'm not hungry until after I've done my exercise. I try to swim every day. So it's around 2.30 in the afternoon that I'm really actually having my one and only meal, which tends to be just salads and fruits and vegetables and pico de gallo and maybe a glass of wine. Maybe once or twice a week is really basically it. I love red wine. I don't eat meat anymore. I love salmon, wild-caught salmon, but I, I can't cook it. I've tried, but I don't enjoy it at home. So when I'm out, if it's on the menu, I always order it. But other than that, I really don't cook meat at home at all. But that works for me. You have to work, you know, choose what works for you. And I also find that when I'm going to travel, I'm very careful, perhaps about a week prior, on what my diet is. Because when I travel, particularly with long airplane flights internationally, I, I really don't, I'll have a small, maybe fruit, but that's about it. And I just drink a ton of water. Otherwise, I'm always having some kind of tummy upset and I don't want to be getting up and down in the airplane. So I'm very careful too when I travel. But once I get to my destination, do I enjoy the food and enjoy the wine and enjoy the company? And you know what's interesting? When I've been in Italy or in Austria, or even recently in Germany, I find I never, ever, ever get sick to my tummy. Whereas when I'm back in the U.S., sometimes the things that I buy, as careful as I am, I'll sometimes have tummy aches. I don't know why. I don't know why. But the important thing is, is to listen to your body. And we hear about intermittent fasting. And yes, that does wonders to your body because what does that do? That allows your body not to be so concerned with digestion. And now your T cells, your, will go and they'll destroy the cancers because we're all exposed to cancers. That's just part of living. But they will destroy the amoebas, the parasites, the moles, the bacterium, whatever that can cause disease. That's the beauty of intermittent fasting, but I don't even recommend that. I just say, listen to your own body. And it ends up because my meal's around 2.30 and I don't eat until around 2.30 the next day, other than occasional fruit, you know, watching my TV or streaming movies. I technically am kind of doing intermittent fasting but I'm not realizing it. You see, the point is, I think you need to be discerning and listening to yourself. Yourself, your own body is very, very wise. And there may be some days where you're not hungry and other days where you're really hungry. Then, then follow it. But just be mindful of what you're putting into your mouth. Try to put things that are fresh and organic. And the less man has been involved in being involved in the processing of it, the better. It's that simple rule. So stay tuned for part three. I'll delve into a little bit on exercise. And also I want to share with you some ex explosive information when it comes to great health that just now scientists are discovering. Have a great day.